Uh, my name is Khalil. Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight um, for the ninth week of our 2020 annual summer lecture series. We'd like to thank all the seniors, affiliates, and sponsors and past speakers this year that have contributed to our challenging summer lecture schedule. We'd also like to thank all of the interns this year for their hard work and contributions to advance our work in this area. We'd further like to thank the governing body USA Rugby and their respective <coughs> territorial rugby football unions and competitive regions, administrators, volunteers, and athletes across the United States who have helped us reach the International Olympic Committee with our work on understanding injuries in rugby sevens. Give me one minute while I share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yep. Awesome. Therefore, I am humbled and honored to introduce our own senior advisor for the Rugby Research and Injury Prevention Group, Dr. Robert Cantu. He is the Medical Director and Director of Clinical Research at the Cantu Concussion Center at Emerson Hospital in Concord, Massachusetts. As a forefront leader in concussion research, Dr. Cantu's professional responsibilities include those of clinical professor in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery, Clinical Therapeutics Leader, ADCTE Center at Boston University School of Medicine, Founding Member and Medical Director, Concussion Legacy Foundation, Boston, Massachusetts, Professor Exercise in Sports Science and Medical Director, National Center for Catastrophic Sports Injury Research, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Senior Advisor, Brain Injury Center, Children's Hospital, Boston, Massachusetts. Vice President and Chairman of Scientific Advisory Committee, National Operating Committee on Standards for Athletic Equipment. Senior Advisor, NFL Head, Neck and Spine Committee. Member of NFLPA, Mackey White Health and Safety Committee. NCAA Concussion Advisory Group Member and NCAA Student Athletic Concussion Injury Litigation Committee. Dr. Cantu has authored over 490 scientific publications, including 34 books on neurology and sports medicine. A master clinician, we are proud to introduce Dr. Robert Cantu as the distinguished keynote speaker for the 2020 RRIPG Summer Lecture Series. He will be presenting on the long-term effects of repetitive head trauma in rugby and collision sports. Dr. Cantu, whenever you're ready, please share your screen. Sorry, I better uh, unmute myself before I share the screen. <laughs> Are you able to see it, Kira? Yes, we can see your screen. All right, good. Want me to just take off? Yes, sounds All right, good. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I thought tonight what I'd do is focus on one of the key interests that we have, obviously, concussion and uh, more extensive brain and spinal cord injury is something that we've been a part of for now almost 50 years. But over the last 20 years, we've been more or less concentrating at BU on the effects of repetitive head injury at the subconcussive level. Not that concussion isn't very important, it is. And that, of course, is an injury that takes somebody out of sport right away. Um, and in every instance should be prevented uh, and um, in every case needs to be diagnosed correctly. Um, some disclosures, but no conflicts. When we are aware of what the media can do when they get a hold of a subject, they can really run with it awfully fast and make a lot of noise. And science tends to obviously uh, 
uh, creep along at a much slower pace. But in the area of repetitive head injury, I must say that the science, largely because there's so much funding that's now available, especially in this country and especially through NIH, um, the science has taken off quite significantly as well. When we formed the CTE Center at BU back in 2008, there were fewer than 10 publications a year uh, on the subject of chronic traumatic encephalopathy and or uh, later life uh, implications of cumulative head trauma. But over the last eight or nine years, um, the number has grown to now over 120 publications a year uh, on this topic. So clearly, this is an area where a lot of research money has been placed and a lot of emphasis uh, is occurring, and I think rightly so. But unfortunately, our knowledge is still quite um, incipient and quite early, and there's certainly much more to be learned uh, than we already have. Uh, I think all of us know that with concussion, a number of things happen. There's an activation of an inflammatory response. Uh, what happens with the ions and nerve cells is an imbalance of ionic concentration uh, with the positive ions, predominantly sodium and potassium, exiting cells into the extracellular space. There's a uh, release of excitatory amino acids. There is a rather chaotic, uh, non-coordinated release of neurotransmitters. Um, there is an energy crisis, and that's why during the immediate period after concussion, we need to, whenever possible, limit uh, the metabolic demands of the brain. And there are also production of free radicals. Following concussion clinical recovery, that is following resolution of the symptoms that have occurred that are recognized as symptoms of concussion. There still can be structural abnormalities seen in the brain uh, as noted by um, diffusion tensor imaging MRI looking at fiber tracks, uh, functional MRI looking at metabolic functioning in the brain, uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, largely looking at blood flow and positron emission tomography, MRI also looking at metabolic uh, activity. And we've been concerned that these studies can be abnormal even when the brain is returned to normal function. And we're not sure what to make of it because we're not certain whether it represents uh, as yet not complete healing but will heal completely? Or is it something that can be cumulative and over time lead to a neurodegenerative process? About 10 years ago, um, a number of publications started to appear in the literature where people found structural, functional, and even cognitive impairments in individuals that had repetitive head trauma primarily from the sports of soccer and football, the two football sports, um, without recognized concussion symptoms. One of the early reports was by Inga Corte, uh, a German woman who's now at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, continuing her MRI work, which her early publication in JAMA in 2012 uh, pointed out the white matter abnormalities, especially in the corpus callosum, uh, that was seen in professional soccer players as compared with swimmers. And there was a statistically uh, increase in axial diffusivity thought to be due to increased fluid in these fiber tracts, uh, suggesting possible injury, uh, injury that may or may not recover over time. Um, she also looked at ice hockey players and also found DTI abnormalities in the white matter of uh, hockey players comparing MRI, DTI MRI, preseason, postseason. So she, back in 2012, was one of the earliest people to point out that you can have structural uh, alteration uh, as shown by DTI. Um, 
in fiber tracts, especially the long fiber tracts, especially the corpus callosum, um, in not only ice hockey players, but in soccer players. And then Michael Lipton, who's had a very long career in MR, uh, diffusion tensor imaging MRI, one of the uh, early pioneers of that uh, modality, uh, showed uh, in an early publication of 38 uh, soccer players who had a lot of years of experience, it, the average was 20 years of experience, that not only did he see abnormalities in DTI uh, in these players, but he started to correlate it with if they averaged greater than 885 headers a year, they were uh, in the group that had the abnormality with DTI. Also, he uh, did impact testing and found some cognitive impairment, but the threshold for that was much higher at 1,800 headers per year. Um, since he published that paper now almost eight years ago, uh, I'm not aware of other people that have duplicated this, so I, I wouldn't get too hung up on exactly 885 headers or 1,800 headers, but uh, to me, the reassuring thing about it is that it's a pretty high number uh, of headers um, before you start to have um, cognitive impairment uh, and a, even a pretty high number before you start to have abnormality in DTI. This is a paper by Tom Talavage out of uh, Purdue. And the important thing in this paper is that he used functional MRI and 50% of the people that he studied, this, these are football players over a course of a football season, 50% um, of the football players with no clinically observable concussions <clears throat> had abnormalities in DTI. And all of the players that he studied with concussion, which was a small number, uh, all of them had uh, abnormality in functional MRI. So using a different, um, a tool to look at the brain, but finding essentially the same thing that you were finding, uh, in this case, metabolic, not structural abnormalities in the brain, um, even without clinical symptoms being recorded. Now, could there have been some concussions um, in this group? Um, yes, because obviously we all know that concussions can be missed uh, on uh, the athletic field and are missed. Uh, hopefully uh, many fewer today than some years back. This is an interesting study by another group of people headed by Nicola Marchi. Um, and his hypothesis was that with concussion, we know there's breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Therefore, uh, if you look for antibodies to S100B protein, which is found in astrocytes in the brain and normally doesn't get into the bloodstream, unless there's breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. But if there is breakdown, you'd find the protein there and you'd expect antibodies to be able to be produced to it. Um, and he had hypothesized that there would be such antibodies found that because there's breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and that you would be able to correlate um, the amount of uh, abnormality on diffusion tensor imaging and the amount of abnormality in terms of the antibodies uh, that would be found um, to the number of hits to the head. The people that had the highest amount of repetitive head trauma would most likely have the greatest amount of antibodies, the greatest amount of DTI abnormality, um, and, and as well, uh, the changes. And it, that's exactly what he found. He found that individuals that had the highest number of hits, subconcussive hits to the head, had the greatest amount of uh, S100B detected in their bud. They had the greatest number or the highest level of S100B antibodies detected. The higher level of antibodies correlated with DTI abnormalities and the DTI abnormalities correlated with cognitive changes uh, as seen by impact testing. Um, that particular paper is of interest because our group at uh, BU working with an animal model 
um, in Lee Goldstein's uh, laboratory. Chad uh, Tag was the lead author on this paper, um, looking at uh, essentially a, a mice model uh, for concussion, uh, found that there was microscopically blood brain barrier breakdown with concussion. Um, and incidentally, there also was microglial proliferation and inflammation seen microscopically as well. This is another um, publication that uh, looked at youth football. And again, these youth football players were followed pre and post season, season and individuals over a course of a season uh, when followed up at the end of the season had abnormalities in DTI uh, seen. Now I think it's important um, that this abnormality we don't know whether that necessarily reflects injury or a reparative process that can be complete or a reparative process that when it has to be undergone repetitively tends to um, uh, lead to a neurodegenerative process. All of the papers that I showed you talked about either preseason, in season, or preseason, postseason, but they didn't follow up because of the funding wasn't there, that wasn't part of the research project. They didn't fo follow up six months later or a year later to see whether the abnormalities went away. And I'll have a little more to say with that in conclusion. Uh, back in 2012, uh, because of the unique vulnerabilities of youngsters' brains in terms of not being myelinated, weak necks, bobblehead doll effect, uh, we wrote a book um, advocating waiting until high school before tackle football, use flag football or touch until then, no heading in soccer until high school, and no full body checking in ice hockey until high school. Um, since that book has been written, the um, full body checking in ice hockey has risen from 11 to um, uh, 13. Um, in soccer in the United States, there's no heading any longer in USA soccer below the age of 10 and limited heading uh, from 11 to 13. In the United States, we still have tackle football in our youth, uh, but there is a greater participation in flag and touch football than there is in tackle football uh, prior to the age of high school. Um, at BU, I'm gonna quickly go over six papers that talk about um, age at first exposure to repetitive head trauma, which also I think can be thought of as um, numbers of years of head trauma, because if you started at a very early age, uh, obviously you're gonna have more years of cumulative trauma than if you started it at a later age. But the early ages seem to be particularly vulnerable. Um, and there were four papers starting with uh, this one by um, uh, Borlas uh, in 2014 that looked at uh, individuals that were playing tackle football um, a, and they were divided into a group, 92 male former players, those that started before the age of 12, those that started after the age of 12. And those that started after the age of 12 um, had significantly um, less uh, cognitive, behavioral, and mood impairments on a variety of neuropsychological tests that were administered. In other words, statistically significant differences between those uh, that started before and after the age of 12. And this was the first of what would be four papers that basically found the same thing in different cohorts. This is a paper um, in which Julie Stamm was the lead author. Uh, it was a group of individuals that, again, um, were looked at in terms of when they started playing football um, and those that started prior to the age of 12 had greater life cognitive impairment compared to the group that started um, uh, later after the age of 12. This is a group of individuals that was studied uh, by Michael Osco uh, 
214 former amateur and professional football players. Um, and essentially those that started before the age of 12 had a two times greater odds ratio for meaningful impairments in behavioral regulation, uh, depression, apathy, and executive function compared to those playing under the age of 12. Um, and then finally, this paper by Jesse, uh, by uh, Michael Osco, again, lead author um, in 2018, uh, looking at 246 football players um, who had donated their brains because they had died uh, to be studied for CTE. And what they found in this uh, is that individuals who started before the age of 12 had earlier cognitive, behavioral, and mood CTE symptoms, uh, earlier onset of them by 13 years. So that the group that started earlier, if they were going to develop CTE, uh, the CTE symptoms were going to start earlier. So essentially four papers showing greater chance of cognitive, behavioral, and mood symptoms in athlete who started playing tackle football prior to the age of 12 versus those that started after the age of 12. In addition to that, Julie Stamm uh, also showed that age of first exposure could also influence white matter microstructure. And this is where um, it is suggestive that these injuries that were, the, pardon me, these changes that were seen on DTI may have been the forerunner of later degeneration of those fiber tracks. What Julie found is that those players that started before the age of 12, um, if you looked at their white matter structure, uh, there was significantly uh, uh, deterioration in the anterior portion of the corpus callosum, the front part of the corpus callosum. Um, these are former NFL football players that were studied and football players, as you know, although they can be hit on the side and the back of the head, the preponderance of the hits they take are to the front of the head. And this paper by Schultz, again, looking at thalamic volume in former uh, professional football players, showed just as has been shown by Charles Burnick in Boxers, um, that individuals that started younger uh, had a um, greater amount of thalamic volume uh, atrophy or smaller thalami uh, as looked at by MRI. Again, suggesting the earlier onset, which by the way does correlate in most cases with more exposure uh, in terms of years of play and more total number of hits uh, leads to a greater amount of damage. Thus, um, starting tackle football before 12 um, in these six papers was associated with a greater chance for later life cognitive, behavioral, and mood deficits as measured by batteries of neuropsychological testing. It was correlated uh, or associated with an earlier onset of CTE symptoms in a group of people who develop CTE. It was correlated with a greater microstructural deficit in the anterior corpus callosum and smaller thalamic volumes. And for individuals, especially in this country, uh, there's a fair amount of pushback that, well, we've got to start Johnny at a very early age because otherwise he won't be a NFL player. He, he won't be the, the football player that he could be. Uh, it, it's true for, I think, all sports uh, that the genetic equalization that happens when somebody reaches their full growth potential uh, is what is going to determine who's going to be an all-star and who isn't. Uh, it's not how early they started playing or what kind of coaching they received. And just as an example of that, um, there are a number of NFL football stars um, that never played football prior to high school who went on to Hall of Fame careers. And some of them are here, Jim Brown, Walter uh, Brown, Tom Brady, uh, Tim Brown, Jerry Rice, et cetera. So you don't have to be a um, individual that starts at a very early age to be 
uh, a very successful, outstanding football player in college uh, or beyond. Uh, rather, it's your genetic endowment and your work ethic that's going to ultimately determine that. Um, very quickly, there are six other papers I want to quickly mention that all correlate the number of times your head gets hit with these subconcussive blows is what correlates with these later life changes and the later life cognitive behavioral mood deficits and or CTE. It is not the number of times you received a concussion. Obviously, concussion counts, but what is most important uh, is the cumulative head trauma in terms of these later life issues, including CTE. One of the early papers um, to make that point uh, was the lead, Phil, Philip Montenegro was the lead author, uh, and then subsequent papers, um, once again, Michael Osco showing white matter signal abnormalities um, in, non, in uh, former National Football League players correlated with years of exposure to play, uh, not correlated with numbers of concussions. Um, also, repetitive head impact exposure correlated with um, abnormal uh, elevated total tau levels in former uh, NFL football players, not the number of concussions. And in the spinal fluid, the tau, uh, uh, alpha, A beta, as well as the uh, inflammatory protein uh, STREM2, again correlated with the total number of years played as a proxy for the total number of hits to the head. It didn't correlate uh, with number of times somebody uh, had been concussed. And indirectly, um, this paper that uh, Jesse Mez was the lead author on, um, again, these are, these are very skewed uh, samples of people because these are all people that had symptoms of CTE, cognitive, behavioral, and uh, dysregulation of uh, mood and, and, and uh, uh, behavior um, that led family to donate their brains to be studied. So it's not an asymptomatic group of people. But in that group, once again, those with the highest amount of exposure um, had the greatest amount of CTE. Out of 111 National Football League players whose brains were studied uh, in this particular sample, 110 or 99% had CTE. When you got to college players, again, these are symptomatic, so we're not talking about incidence or prevalence. It's just simply sample of uh, symptomatic brains that were studied. Uh, it dropped from 99 to 90. And when you uh, dropped it further to high school, um, the incidence was 14%, which still is alarming to think there was any. Um, and although the numbers are small, um, no uh, CTE has been found so far in anybody younger than the age of 17. So nobody prior to high school. Um, this is another study by Jesse that uh, looks at the duration of football play and your chances for CTE. And essentially, if you play uh, football, American style football for less than four and a half years, your chance for developing CTE is one tenth uh, of what it is if you play more than 14 and a half years. And actually the cutoff to be in a high risk group uh, is really 11 years. So if you start, play for 11 years, you're certainly uh, in the high risk group for developing CTE. Um, looking at that another way, a child starting tackle football at age 11 instead of 14 uh, would have played four years of football prior to high school. So instead of playing four years, they played eight years and they would have doubled their risk for developing CTE. And a child uh, who started at age five instead of age 14 would be up there in that 10 times greater risk uh, for developing CTE. Another individual who looked at their own brain bank uh, and whether or not CTE was found in individuals, this is a Mayo Clinic brain bank, Kevin Bennick, 
uh, is the lead author. He found that football was the only sport that of the collision sports played in our country, uh, rugby's not included here, uh, is the only sport that had an increased risk for CTE. In his group, um, playing through high school or just high school did not increase risk for CTE. Um, and he found no evidence for CTE in his group that only played at youth or high school level. Uh, he interestingly enough found also that if you played two, two or more sports with um, high collision likelihood, like uh, football, ice hockey, and lacrosse, there wasn't an increased risk for CTE beyond the football alone. But the numbers in those groups were pretty small, um, and I suspect that may not be the finding uh, if uh, much more robust numbers uh, were looked at. So, um, structural, metabolic, cognitive, behavioral, and mood changes can occur from repetitive head trauma without recognized concussion. The duration of exposure in years played, a football proxy for number of hits to the head and not the number of concussions is correlated with the severity of those changes and the age of first exposure under the age of 12 versus later uh, also increases uh, those changes. I want to finish with a paper that is just recently published a few weeks ago because of several things. Number one, it deals with rugby, uh, which is uh, keen to all of us. Number two, it deals with female rugby players, which there has been very little data compared with guys um, collected in females. Most of the data uh, in our country has come from football, which is played mostly by guys. So uh, obviously the data has been in, uh, in guys. Um, in interestingly, in our uh, brain bank, we're uh, now going north of a thousand brains that have been studied. Um, almost all the cases of CTE, just two are in women, uh, the rest are in men, uh, but there have only been about a dozen women brains that have been studied. So there, the, the data on women is very uh, lack, lacking. The second uh, or third reason I wanted to point to this is this was a longitudinal study. And it's the first one that I'm aware of that has looked at these diffusion tensor imaging abnormalities that a number of people have reported um, during versus immediately at the end of a season. Um, but they haven't reported how long those abnormalities persisted because their studies essentially terminated. Um, they also, in this study, look at not just diffusion tensor imaging abnormalities, but they looked at functional MRI. So they were looking at structural uh, metabolic activity uh, in the brain and, and uh, changes that occurred uh, that can be followed uh, by that modality. Um, so they, the object of this study was to longitudinally assess brain microstructure and function in female varsity athletes participating in contact and non-contact sports. And what they found was that there were longitudinal changes that occurred in the microstructure and function in otherwise asymptomatic female rugby players. So as far as we know, these rugby players had no symptoms as far as we know, they were not concussed. Uh, this was just repetitive subconcussive trauma. They did not find any microstructural uh, DTI abnormalities or functional MRI uh, abnormalities in the swimmers and the non-contact uh, collision athletes that was the control group uh, for this paper. Um, the researchers found not just these microstructural abnormalities occurring um, season to season, but they found a difference between on-season and off-season. 
But most importantly, what they found was that there was a progression or a tendency toward a progression that was statistically significant, at least in, in their group, um, in terms of season one to season two. The DTI changes that were seen uh, on season, uh, during season one, progressed to season two, um, suggesting that that might be injury but it doesn't prove it because these abnormalities that are seen, whether they be metabolic abnormalities or whether they be uh, DTI abnormalities or whether they even be, uh, which is not the study of this particular paper, uh, cognitive abnormalities, we don't know whether or not they're transient and compensatory or reparative um, or whether they're, if, repeated the beginning of a neurodegenerative process. But when you put it in context with what we've shown you from the data about years of exposure correlating with greater later life behavioral mood and cognitive problems, years of exposure correlating with greater life thalamic abnormalities, years of exposure correlating with greater white matter abnormality, especially in the corpus callosum, it certainly um, at this point in time, I think, um, makes the case that we need to be very concerned that this repetitive trauma is not innocuous and is more probably than not leading to a neurodegenerative process in susceptible individuals. And not that we need to not uh, engage in sports at risk for head trauma, but we need to do everything we can uh, to start the head trauma part of it later, and we need to do everything we can to reduce the amount of head trauma exposure, especially subconcussive, as we practice the sport. Obviously, during the active contest itself, uh, there's not a great deal that can be done, but um, there is a great deal that can be done to reduce head trauma uh, in terms of how you practice the sport and how you take head contact out of the practice. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions or do whatever Victor and, and Kara want us to do. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Cantu. It was very interesting. If you'd like, you can open up the screen back to everyone. And we can open it up for questions. I just want to have a quick note first. So we have a larger number of people than usual on the Zoom call. So if possible, if you want to ask a question, um, it would be great if you could underneath participants at the bottom of your screen, if you click that, and then at the bottom right, you should see something called raise your hand or raise hand. It's a feature on Zoom. And if you do that, I'll be able to see it on my end and then you can unmute and talk. That way we don't have too many people jumping in at one time to ask questions. So we can open up the floor for questions right now if anyone has any. Hi, Dr. Kanto, can you hear me? Yes, Dan, I can. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it was really, really insightful. Um, even from someone who is very little in terms of neurological knowledge, um, being a nutritionist. So yeah, very, very insightful. Um, I was wondering if you have sort of any insight or comment into similar sort of concussive or subconcussive injuries in uh, sliding sports in particular. So skeleton, bobsleigh and and Bobsley and Luge, and they've been gaining a little bit of media and research like very recently. Um, I think the New York Times published uh, a, a, an article on Sledhead, which is uh, seem, seems to be a unique thing for sliding sports, which comes about with like, head, uh, headaches, fogginess, and sort of a loss of balance after a particularly bumpy run or experiencing a lot of G um, going through a um, through uh, like a bobsleigh run. Um, so I was wondering if you 
had any comments on that or if any insights with that in regards to sort of concussion and subconcussive uh, sort of trauma? Well, that's a great, great question, Dan. Unfortunately, I'm not aware of anybody that has used uh, DTI or functional MRI or PET MRI uh, in sliding sport athletes, either bobsledders or, or skeleton um, athletes. Um, it certainly would suggest to me that these individuals um, sound like they honestly, when they talk about that sled head, I worry that you're really talking about a concussion that they may have had just from the G-forces they pulled. But I'm also aware in skeleton that your head can go down on the ice in the process of, it just is impossible to keep your head up pulling the forces you pull. Um, and so um, whether it's because you actually banged your head on the ice or whether it's just G-forces, I don't know. But I would certainly be very concerned that when somebody was describing symptoms um, that are not being right after making a run like that, that they may represent concussion symptoms. Now, I haven't seen um, a detailed study of that, um, but it certainly needs to be done. And it also would be very interesting if uh, somebody would uh, apply DTI more uh, types of imaging to these athletes to see whether or not structural issues could be found. Um, we don't have a lot of data on either um, bobsledders or, or skeleton athletes, but it is rather alarming. I'm not suggesting that it's exclusively head trauma at all, because I don't know, but we do have a number, especially of bobsledders, that have committed suicide. And whether or not significant head trauma and or subconcussive trauma pulled by pulling the G's that they, they, they pull, and they, and they do hit their heads on the walls on occasion too. Um, whether that's playing a role or not, I don't know. But I think a lot more study needs to be done. It's a great question. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to it. I wish I did. Uh, it's, yeah, it's brilliant. Just even just having that insight is uh, really, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can go to the next question from Dr. Hume. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cantu. So I'm wondering, given the growth and anatomy of the brain, and the evidence, although it's limited so far in terms of showing um, impact and under 12 and later effects. Do you think we should be pushing more strongly for a conservative age number worldwide for non-contact for children? Because we get contacted by the media all the time. You know, can we safely say, say the age of 12, people really should not be involved in these contact sports? Well, Unfortunately, you're, you're, you've asked the question, Dr. Hume, as somebody who feels very strongly on this subject. Um, and for instance, in England, I'm aware that a number of school kids have to take rugby and have to participate in rugby at a very early age, whether they want to or not. Um, and I couldn't think of you know, I, I'm not down on rugby. I think rugby is great, but I also think rugby could be played in a flag or touch format too at a younger age. Um, I definitely think you either alter the sport or you start later. And whether it's 12 or 14, I, I don't, there's no solid data to suggest other than our four papers from BU. Um, it, it may have been statistically equally um, powerful at age 13 as of age 12, but there weren't that many people that started at 13. So we're into that numbers group where we had the numbers that fit with 12. So going with what you have now, I would certainly support anybody who would ask a youth to play a collision sport in an altered format, taking the most dangerous for head trauma part of it out. 
or just not playing it at all until a later age. But I think you can get uh, the benefits uh, without the risk from a sport, say, like rugby by just playing in a flag or touch format. And I do know that with our Rugby Smart and the changes in New Zealand, you know, we've definitely gone down that route. And I loved your slides, actually, about the um, experience of people and whether they'd played early on and whether they ended up being successful. Because we also have data to show that it's good to participate in a number of different sports rather than just a single sport and have a number of head exposures going through. And I guess a lot of the work that Dr. Doug King has done in particular in terms of monitoring head impacts for both the females and the males, we're showing that females are getting more head impacts than males in rugby or rugby league. And so it is that cumulative effect. So I'm, I'm really um, pleased to see that you're also showing that you know, same information. We're collaborating with Purdue at the moment. We have a study uh, where we're, we've instrumented mouth guards for children and it's a prospective study. They've done the functional MRIs and we're looking at the head impacts and also the, the diagnosed concussions, but a whole variety of tests. So I agree with you, there needs to be more prospective studies so that we can provide you know, more evidence so that parents can make informed choices about how they want their children to participate in sport. Yeah, those are, those are wonderful comments and I, I agree with all of them. And I think it's wonderful that, that you're carrying on your work collaborating with our country so that both countries can benefit from it. That's all great. And this, this issue of, it's so unfortunate. Um, there's no question that whether you play golf or you play tennis or you play football or you play ice hockey, if you play just that sport year round, you will be better at a very early age at playing that sport than somebody that only plays it for three months. But, when you're 18, 19, and 20, you won't be. Your genetic endowment is going to determine whether you're going to be super elite or not. And by playing that sport, the incidence of repetitive head injury, I mean, repetitive recurrent injury from uh, repetitious of the same type of activity is much higher if you just stay with one sport than if you move around between different sports. So, it was so much better way back when, when we all just played the sport in season than it is today, at least in this country, where unfortunately so many parents mean well, but it's, I think they're doing the wrong thing when they just have their kid doing one sport year round because they think they can get them ahead to a higher level. Okay, excellent. Our next question is, from Oren. Hi, Dr. Cantu. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was Hi, Oren. phenomenal. Um, so I've actually been looking at um, EKG patterns that are able to see if there's increased intracranial pressure and make that correlation. And I was wondering if you think there's a possibility of finding a di diagnostic tool that's able to measure like concussion without being, you know, without being invasive, without anything like that. So that, you know, we actually have, uh, you know, something measurable to be able to diagnose concussion. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, it, it's, it's uh, good luck with your work. I'm delighted to hear about it. Um, Yes, we've been looking for a, a biomarker of concussion for decades. Um, the imaging studies that we hoped would help us um, right now are all macroscopic studies. In other words, we were talking about DTI MRI. We were talking about functional MRI. Those are really research tools. They're not widely spread clinical tools. Um, DTI does look at the microstructure of the brain, but the regular MRIs that we use, even with our flare images, susceptibility weighted imaging, and so on, it's still a macroscopic study. And the injury of concussion is primarily, in most cases, uh, a biochemical injury, dysfunction, 
but it is a structural injury as well in many individuals. And we've seen, tragically, individuals whose lives have ended, um, usually by suicide, tragically. Uh, so their brains could be studied while they were going through the throes of a concussion, meaning immediately after it. Uh, we've seen swelling of the uh, fiber tracts. Um, we've seen diffuse axonal swelling. We've seen disruption of axons. So we know there's both a metabolic injury and a structural injury in many concussions. Um, but our current imaging modalities don't allow us uh, to get down clinically modalities don't allow us to get down at the microstructural level. Other areas that have been looked at, which we have great hope for, is because so much of the brain is, is involved with eye movement and eye tracking. There's been a tremendous amount of research, uh, most of it very exciting, um, but showing great promise that maybe by looking at uh, smooth pursuit eye movements, convergence, saccadic eye movements, um, pupillary changes, that we will be able in a fairly high percentage of individuals to be able to correlate those changes with people with concussion. I don't think any one tool that ever measures just one thing though, will probably be um, more sensitive than maybe 80 or a little beyond it. I don't think it'll ever get up to 100% sensitive. So I think you're always gonna to have to be using uh, multiple tools. Then there are the biomarkers that we've been looking at or kind of thinking we're on the cusp of getting uh, for 20 years. First, it was S100B protein, which is kind of up and down in terms of what different researchers have found there. The kind of the new kid on the block that's gotten a lot of recent press is neurofilament light. And it certainly there's a paper that's just been published. It's extremely um, uh, positive about a uh, blood analysis for neurofilament light that involves a kind of like a thousand times more sensitive analysis than previous ones um, that did correlate very highly uh, recognizing concussions and elevation of neurofilament light uh, quickly, which is not again an on the field thing, but it certainly could be used in clinic the next day, certainly could be used in managing these patients uh, in the subsequent days after. Thank you so much. Kira, may I just make a comment about uh, Oren's question? Yes. Please. Yeah, so we've, I've got some PhD students who are looking at um, heart rate variability as well as EEG. So Dr. Andrew Lowe from AUT has a new device which allows us to measure this. So one of our design students actually at the moment um, has a new helmet for rugby. So, you know, the soft um, headgear and is able to measure information on, on the field at the time. And that has resulted from some work that we've done with NASA, with one of my PhD students looking at cognitive and physical fatigue and being able to monitor that. And so I think there's some really exciting uh, projects and work, you know, going on at the moment. So if you want to discuss a bit more about some of those technologies and things, I can link you with some people. Super. I think I asked Erica to unmute. She's ready. Yes, I'm unmuted. Hi, Dr. Cantu. How are you? Good. How are you, Erica? Good, thank you. Um, I just want to thank you again for being on tonight. The presentation was great, and it's just always so good to hear you speak. Um, I actually wanted to ask like a really boots on the ground question as an athletic trainer um, and a strength and conditioning specialist. You know, we look at sports um, and sport bodies like the NFL, like this research in rugby, where we're really moving towards trying to prevent concussion. Um, assess and diagnose early when we can and do all the right things. And then, you know, you come across athletes that you work with. Um, my dad was a boxer. I work with some boxers. I work with some MMA athletes. And, you know, they're involved in sports where they're, the certifying bodies are not trying to protect the athletes. Um, you know, it's integral to the sport um, that they're taking hits to the head. And, 
at a young age, I feel like, you know, whether it's like the parents pulling them out or they're realizing and they step away. But now as you get to adults, you have these people who are really elite in their sport and they kind of just can't walk away from it. And there's this in between where either they're fearful or they just don't even want to hear the information, right? So I can quote research to them and, and tell them, you know, all my knowledge on the topic. But I just wanted to ask from you, um, like if you could say one thing to these athletes, just coming from your background and seeing everything that you've seen throughout your career, what would be the thing that, you know, we could say to them as professionals working with them? Well, the one thing I would say to them is that when they've reached adulthood, 18 and up, that they can choose for themselves what they want to do, and I will support them completely, and I'll try to make it as safe for them as possible. But I would plead with them to try to condition for their activity whenever possible without taking blows to the head. Uh, you mentioned boxing. World champions who are very well compensated today, very, very, very well, most of them don't fight more than once or twice a year. It's very common to fight once a year, or once every 10 or 11 months. They mostly stay in good cardiovascular condition. Most of them stay on uh, physical condition and strength training as well but they don't spar. They hit bags, but they don't have people hit them in the head. And then a very few weeks before a fight, um, they may go back, almost all of them do, in sparring in some degree, but the sparring is not getting clobbered the way it used to be. But I do have one um, other thought about boxing that is a particular uh, uh, issue with me. Um, and I've had a long experience as a ringside physician and a long experience working with the Association uh, for Ringside Physicians in, in this country, trying to make boxing safer. Boxing is the only sport I'm aware of where you go out on your shield. It is not honorable to say I'm having a bad night. I've taken too much punishment and I want to step aside. And yes, hopefully your trainer will do that for you, but they may or may not uh, uh, realize the situation. As opposed to another sport, which I don't particularly uh, personally like, because there you can get hit in the head, not only with feet, knees, elbows, and everything else, ultimate fighting. Um, but in that sport, quote unquote, it's perfectly honorable to tap out knowing that you're in a submissive hold or the referee will stop the bout very quickly if you've taken too many blows to the head. And so it's almost nobody that's been very many years in UFC that hasn't had stoppages and losses on their record. Whereas many a boxer will punch through and fight through a concussion because the bout wasn't stopped and take more trauma, unfortunately, than is good for their brain long-term. So I, I wish there were a way that the people in boxing would come up with an honorable way for these people to say, you know, it, it's not my night. <laughs> no, that, that really makes sense. And thank you, because I like, you know, Obviously, I'm along in my career now, but I wrote my thesis on boxing, and it's exactly what you're saying. Like, they can't tap out, and it's blow after blow and blow on top of a concussion. And, you know, it's not like I'm very involved with the sport, but I do have some clients that I work with for other injuries, you know, whether it's shoulder, knee, um, that are boxers. And it's just so hard knowing that that's what they're going back to because, of course, you want to protect them and, and keep them safe. Um, but I guess it, to, to your point, it's in the education of the people who are, have the power to make the sport safer and protect them more. Good luck with your career. Thank you.
Okay, next I have a question from one of our interns, Ruth. She's not feeling the best, so she asked me if I could ask the question for her. She wanted to ask, with regard to your discussion about early sport specialization having a negative effect, how do you feel about the efficacy of early, the early diversification model in terms of sports for youth? I think it's a good idea to have different youths play different sports. Um, I think it's probably um, best if the athlete honestly likes the sport they're playing and they may, they may be started in something that they realize that this isn't for me. And if they don't really have a passion to keep doing it, I, I wouldn't push them to do it ever. Uh, but I do think the idea clearly of not concentrating on one sport and being exposed to multiple sports is a very wise one. Um, even in this country, um, as I was alluding to, overuse injuries are more common than traumatic injuries. And the overuse injuries go way up when somebody does just one thing, whether it be tennis or skating or whatever, year round is composed as compared with breaking it up with different activities that are using different parts of the body in different ways. Excellent, thank you. I think our next question is from Mr. Michael Crafton. I'll ask him to unmute. I think that Wi-Fi is a little slow there, Michael. Michael, I think your Wi-Fi is slow. Shut the camera off. Try that. Yeah, we're having difficulties hearing you clearly. Can you hear me a little better now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I apologize if my question's too similar to that of uh, Dr. Hume. I was kind of interested in some of the same um, issues around the, the current lack of um, information and studies that are out there on rugby compared to uh, soccer and, and football perhaps, but if you were to provide a recommendation to governing bodies around uh, in particular what um, youth associations should do um, with kind of starting or the, or the age, ages at which uh, kids could start engaging in um, tackle rugby um what what's your current kind of opinion on that and, and to the extent it's not uh not fully developed or developed yet i just kind of be curious as to where, where you currently sit on that so i we, we have four peer-reviewed papers that have the age of 12 where clearly um a difference has been shown. There also is quite a body of literature um, totally beyond that that just talks about the ages of 9 to 12 being the areas, the ages of the greatest connectivity of the brain, the greatest metabolic activity of the brain, the pruning of your DNA that's, that is going to allow you to be the cognitive, uh, the uh, impulse control that you were genetically given. Um, the, the mood issues in terms of uh, not depressed and not anxious and uh, no panic attacks and that kind of thing. The way you were born, the greatest amount of ac activity uh, goes on between roughly nine and 12. Obviously, if you went a little beyond that, you'd probably be a little safer. Um, but we know that there's a lot that is happening then. And I personally would be, as I've said before, very supportive of taking all types of sports at high risk of head injury and modifying them um, so that you either didn't play them until a later age or if you're going to play them at those earlier ages the head trauma comes out of it so as i said before flag football flag rugby uh ice hockey but no checking um soccer but no heading 
uh, boxing, but no blows above the clavicles. It can be argued that you can't do that um, with just body blows. Um, it certainly is not foolproof. There would be an occasional blow, I'm sure, that would go above uh, the shoulder. So if you want to just simply start it at a later age, you would have no argument for me. That makes sense, because because I guess I, I view the messaging with that as essentially, you know, e even if there's not a, a robust amount of information out there on any particular sport, um, the the current um, um, medical knowledge in any sport or just with, with how this um, affects the brain uh, regardless of the particular activity you're engaging in, we at least know, you know, th this is our current understanding and, and it should be applied to all sports. I, th that's my takeaway anyways. I'm not a medical person, so I'm using very no, I, lame and, and terms. I would agree with you. And I, and I think the thing that is really important, uh, and, and the reason I say modify the activity, take out the, act, the part of it that deals with uh, high risk for head trauma, but still play the sport in a modified manner, is we, we know that we want our kids being physically active. We know that we have to have them playing sports. And not all of them are going to want to run or have a body to be very good at necessarily long distance running or, or whatever. Um, you can't necessarily, mo many kids will enjoy swimming and other kids won't enjoy swimming. We need them playing sport. We need them playing, being physically active. We know if they're active as a youngster, they're more than eight times more likely to be active as an adult. We know the physical activity is a very positive effect, not emotionally, but possibly even cognitively uh, on the brain. And so I'm all for the physical activity. I'm all for people playing sports and just exercising in general. But I think the head trauma part of it, um, we need to rethink for our youngsters. Thank you. It looks like we have two more questions. We can start with one of our interns, Megan. She wants to unmute. Hi, so my name is Megan. Um, I'm from New Jersey and I attend a school town in Maryland. Um, I have a pre-physical therapy concentration, but I do play soccer for my university. And kind of bouncing off of what you said before about implementing like a no header type thing, New Jersey youth soccer. So since I'm from New Jersey, uh, I know quite a few things about the programs here and under U11. So age 11 and younger are not to head the ball. And then from U12 to U14 is restricted. So I think that's like pretty neat that our um, organization here has adopted that throughout the state of New Jersey. But I do have a question regarding, so there's no really regulation once it hits U15. So as you go up in age level, do you think that there should be some restriction as far as how much um, heading players do? Because I know in college and everything, there isn't really a restriction in practice and stuff. And when we're at school, we have the ball in our world just like quite frequently. So I wasn't sure if that was anything that could affect players as a whole concussion-wise. Yeah, I think every sport, just as we talked about taking youth sports and modifying the activity that has highest risk for head injury and, and playing the sport without that particular activity, whether it be heading in soccer or tackling in football or body checking uh, or checking in general uh, in ice hockey. When you now play the sport, you can greatly reduce your head trauma by reducing the physical activity and modifying how you do that activity. Um, and a good example, for instance, is football. Most people don't understand it, but at the highest level of football, the National Football League, because they are players that have lawyers for their agents and have negotiated a collective bargaining agreement, they can only have padded football practices 14 times during 18 weeks of the season. That's less than once a week. And they can't have a single 
full padded practice in the off season. So all the off season stuff is done without hitting and tackling. And it's been from that, that now in our country, colleges are beginning to pick up on it. And they're beginning to pick up on not tackling in season. The Ivy League will not be playing this coming fall because of COVID-19. But if they were, once the season starts, you won't be tackling at all other than a game. But that doesn't mean you can't practice tackling on mannequins. You can practice tackling on robots. Or you can practice tackling even on another player in which instead of taking them to the ground, you do what we call thud tackling. It's played at as full speed, but you essentially touch the individual and then let your hands go. You keep them on your feet. You don't bring them to the ground. So you take the injurious part of it out. Well, all sports can modify individually the most dangerous part and minimize it uh, with such uh, similar things that football is doing. Right, thank you. Looks like we have one. Changes in New Jersey. That is excellent. We, I don't think we have that here in Michigan. I think it looks like we had one final question from an, our intern, Dimpy. I'm not sure if she lost connection, however, because I can no longer see her on my screen. Um, if she hops back on, she can ask her question, but does, oh, there she is. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Tantu. Thank you so much for that informative presentation and all the information. My name is Dimpy. I'm a second year medical student at Rutgers Robert Wood in New Jersey. Um, so I had more of a question regarding the current events of our health. Um, and especially since at my school, there's a recent research study that's still being conducted about COVID being um, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So with the effects of COVID on the nervous system and the nerve damage it could possibly cause, do you think that COVID, especially since the NFL is starting up again um, and the sports are trying to get back into it, do you think players who have, who have had COVID um, are at more of a risk of having nerve damage after injury, or do you think it will play as a risk factor with all the research that's coming out about it? Well, first of all, I have to say, wonderful that you're in medical school, congratulations. Hope you have a wonderful long career and enjoy it a lot. Um, I am not a COVID expert, but I certainly do follow it. And unfortunately, uh, follow it closer than I'd probably like to because we're all being, uh, moved around because of it. Yeah, and you're absolutely right that not the virus itself, but the effects of the virus and the inflammatory response to it can lead to, in some individuals, a coagulopathy that can manifest by clotting in blood vessels in your toes and losing toes. It can give you a rash. It can do the same clotting in your brain, in which case stroke can happen. And it can also lead to a myocarditis, uh, inflammation uh, of the heart, uh, which is a, a problem, a, a significant problem that not enough people have been studied long term to know whether or not um, the implications of getting over it is that's it and we don't have to worry about it or whether they're going to be long term ramifications. So it is, I think, playing a little bit of roulette that people are playing right now going into situations, um, unbubbled situations. It's one thing like the National Hockey League and the National Basketball League where everybody's sequestered in a closed environment and tested daily. And it's another situation like Major League Baseball and the National Football League where these athletes go home and leave the stadium at night and they fly to other cities and uh, they, yes, they get tested every day and that's hopefully uh, what's going to prevent too much spread. But I, I have great concerns that we're not going to find that um, situation working out too well for these uh, leagues being able to complete their seasons. And I just hope that these very, very healthy people um, that do pick up COVID-19, a small percentage are probably going to pick up situations that will um, be a concern later on too.
but I am not a COVID expert. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Excellent. Um, I have one quick question actually I'd like to ask as well. You mentioned at the beginning of your presentation about how subconcussive impacts to the head can um, generate the production of free radicals and therefore oxidative stress in the brain. Do you know if there's been any research conducted on the effects of antioxidants and the consumption of antioxidants and if they're helpful for athletes who face repetitive subconcussive head impacts? Yes, there's been research on it, and there's been also research on anti-inflammatory agents, steroids as well. And so far, the data is not positive, um, and it, it, it may be that it's just a question of how things were done or what was used. But so far, it's not been shown to be therapeutic. Okay, thank you. Maybe um, you can find the answer to that question. Maybe. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, I think Dr. Lopez also has a few questions if he wants to jump in. Yes. Thanks so much, uh, Kira. And thank you, Dr. Cantu. It was a phenomenal lecture as usual, sir. Yeah. Nothing less than a, uh, excellent. Um, of course, I'll have to uh, bring in the, the rugby question. And that is, uh, for the... Uh, side of the audience that um, advocates that uh, thug tackling or minimal amounts of tackling won't allow us to approximate match uh, tackling and therefore expose a player to potential injury. How do we um, counter that? I'm an advocate that the uh, youth need to have contact removed. I do agree on that. Uh, there's no way I can see, and again, I was a multi-sport athlete as well, and I just can't see how athletes wouldn't benefit from having less contact at a younger age. But there is that side of the audience that still disagrees and states that approximation of match tackling or scrimmages, uh, won't make a player competitive enough. And I don't know if Pro Professor Hume has any comment on this as well. I think um, we can discuss some of the efforts of Wint and Gabbett of where they want you to approximate a certain amount of um, tackling or uh, match play in training to equivalent, you know, to uh, be equivalent to what a player would encounter. So I guess, the question I have, sir, and that is, what do we say to this crowd that advocates for an approximation um, of tackling or approximation of play similar to match play to make a player more competitive? Well, one of the things I would say is uh, put them in touch with Buddy Tevens, the coach at Dartmouth. Uh, Dartmouth is not exactly known as a football power, uh, even in the Ivy League, uh, yet it has been a co-champion several of the last years in the Ivy League since Buddy Teven several years ago went to a no tackling ever for a Dartmouth player against another Dartmouth player. In fact, that's one of the pitches he makes to mom when he sits in their living room and says, mom, your, your son will come to Dartmouth and he'll never tackle another Dartmouth player, and he doesn't, but he has his players tackling uh, a robot, which is a me mechanical thing that he and a former grad student devised um, that, that scoots around the field, much like a runner would. He has them doing an awful lot of work on pads. He has them doing a lot of, of thud tackling where they wrap people up, but they don't bring them to the ground. And in fact, they hold them up from going to the ground, and they do a lot of drills that simulate what otherwise would be full contact drills, but they're really um, like almost like dance moves that dance is the wrong way to use it. They're equivalent the, to a regular move that you'd make on a football field, but because it's choreographed and everybody knows what's coming, uh, the chance of getting hurt is, is quite significantly reduced. You can practice the sport, you can practice tackling in ways that are, that are different than uh, 
uh, full contact, full speed, bring them to the ground, and be as good at it as if you did do that. Uh, and, and certainly the proof would be to talk to Buddy Tevens and let him tell you that his Dartmouth team tackles better using the training methods they use now than they did using the previous one. So I think it can be done. Great, thank you so much. Uh, please, Professor, go ahead. Yeah, so I concur exactly. It's about progression and it's about reducing the magnitude and the number of head impacts. And so being a biomechanist, obviously I'm, I'm all for uh, you know, correct technique and progressing that safely. And I completely agree with Dr. Cantu that it is possible. We just need better education of coaches in the different sports to enable them to make that happen. Well, thank you both. And uh, I, I, again, I think you both agree with what I'm saying. There's that side of the audience that's definitely going to be um, pro tackle, pro um, uh, scrimmage, pro uh, uh, in way to approximate match impacts. But I don't think that's necessarily what we have to do. Well, I'm delighted to know that Dr. Hume is of a similar mind. <laughs> and it's such a pleasure to see you. Believe me, it's wonderful from my side. Great, thank you. And uh, I just want to conclude and let me, um, uh, so Tiffany Smith, um, um, Dimpy Shaw, they are both uh, second, going into their second year at Robert Wood Johnson uh, Medical School. Um, Orin is just completing her senior year in medical school at, uh, Antigua, and she is now finishing her final rotations. And um, again, we're missing a couple of people on the call, but uh, we have um, Samantha Lopez as well as Kira, and uh, um, also um, Megan, who are interested in medical school versus uh, doctors in physical therapy. They're both very eager to advance their careers. Uh, we have a very young group here, and um, Freedom as well. And, um, and of course, you know Mr. Victoria Christian, he's on the call and uh, just got out of HSS, uh, we know that. <laughs> uh, it was entangling to get out of work. <laughs> but again, uh, thank you everyone for what a great talk uh, and a great um, lecture series. I guess uh, I can just conclude and say that it was a uh, uh, very challenging. Um, every topic that we had, uh, different speakers, and all I can do is thank you so much, Dr. Kentu, Dr. Hume, for joining us, as well as supporting uh, all of our efforts on our end. Our pleasure. Good luck Before to you all. We